Welcome back to the Reading and Writing Podcast. My guest today is Peter Swanson, author of the new book, Every Vow You Break. Peter, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me. Well, if someone hasn't heard about your new novel yet, how would you describe Every Vow You Break? Um, it's, uh, it's what I call a linear thriller. I'm, I'm only making that distinction because most of my thrillers um, tend to be nonlinear in the sense that they have different time periods. Um, sometimes they have different narrative voices um, that tell the story from different perspectives. This is very much a straight ahead thriller in the sense that there is a woman, Abigail Baskin, she's about to get married. She's a somewhat reluctant bride and she has a one night fling on her bachelorette weekend, um, realizes she's made a mistake, hope, hopes to get away with it. Um, but the guy shows up on her honeymoon stalking her. And this is the, um, the premise of the book. And it goes from there. And, uh, there's a few twists and turns along the way. It gets kind of weirder than you, than you think. Um, but the basic premise is a, is a thriller where um, the reader learns what's happening along with Abigail. So, so everything to her, um, the reader finds out that it is in her perspective. So it's kind of a um, ordinary person makes a mistake and things things go haywire. And do you remember the original idea or impetus that led you to write every vow you break? Well, it's funny. It's it's kind of what I was just talking about, which is. Um, the type of thriller I wanted to write, I wanted to write a thriller that was, um, again, this sort of straight ahead, um, type of thing, like, a, like an Ira Levin book is the way I think of it. Sort of like Rosemary's baby, where we're just learning things as Rosemary learns them and all this weird stuff is happening, um, to her. So that was the kind of book, um, I knew I was interested in writing a kind of gender reversed fatal attraction. Um, where instead of the man cheating on his wife um, and then suffering the consequences of that, it's a woman who makes this mistake and then is trying to um, avoid having to tell her her new husband what she did on their bachelorette weekend. Um, at, when I had this initial idea, I don't think it was enough to hang a whole book on, but then I came up with sort of a secondary idea about what was really going on under the surface, which I won't talk about because it's a spoiler. Um, and that, and I combined those two things and came up with uh, the the whole book. And so what was your writing journey that led you to writing and publishing your very first novel? I mean, my writing journey uh, is, I think, similar to a lot of other writers in the sense that I was a voracious, almost obsessive reader as a young boy. Um and I started reading adult fiction, mainly adult genre fiction, uh, mystery thrillers, science fiction, anything I could really get my hands on quite young. Probably when I was like 10, 11, 12, I started, um, you know, borrowing my parents' books. Um, and I loved, I loved reading suspense. Um, and I started writing quite young. I started writing little short stories, little poems. Um, but I didn't, I didn't decide and I, and I kept writing stories and poetry all through my 20s but it wasn't until i was in my 30s that i decided to try my hand at a full-length novel and uh, it just seemed natural that i would write a mystery novel because it's my favorite it's my go-to uh, read it's what i pick up when i want to read a book um and uh started in my 30s wrote a couple books that weren't published um but i i turned out that i loved writing novels more than I liked writing anything. I love being in the middle of a big story and, um, waking up and going, returning to that story and kind of adding to it and doing this process over the course of a year, um, turned out to be what I love. So I, you know, I wrote three novels that were unpublished and, um, couldn't find an agent, uh, got a little discouraged. Um, but, but told myself that the important thing was that I loved doing it. Um, so I kept doing it and it was my fourth book that got me an agent and got me a sale. So that happened when I was in my mid forties. And then since then, um, I've had pretty much a book a year come out. So this is my seventh. And what do you think you learned from those three unpublished novels? <laughs> that they weren't very good. <laughs> I mean, 
you know, what you, what you learn is how to write a book. Um, I mean, there's only one way to learn how to do that, which is trying it. There's no, you, you can't take a course beforehand that tells, you know, you have to make your own mistakes. Um, I will t- say one really specific thing I learned, which is I, the first two I wrote were sort of quirky novels about a, um, a sort of down on his heels poet um, who solves a couple crimes. Um, one at a college where he's a visiting professor and one um, when he's um, interviewing an older poet, he he sort of stumbles into a crime. Um, and I think those were uh, books. And I loved writing those books, but since I didn't get published on them, I, I decided to write what I thought was a more commercial thriller. Um, and I really started to think about, I, I came up with this idea of a, a bridal party that gets uh, trapped in a limousine on the day of the wedding and held hostage. And I, it, when I was writing it, I, I was like, this one will sell. Like, this is a really commercial idea. It would be a great movie. Um, and I think that was the only book I've ever written in that sort of cynical stance that I was trying to write what I thought would be a popular book. And that book got no interest at all. Actually, the the Poet Mysteries, I did get an um, agent for those, and I had an editor interested, but it never sold. But the, the book I wrote, um, just hoping to write something that would sell, I think was is without a doubt my weakest book. Um, and after that, I was like, I'm not going to do that again. I'm going to write books that please me, first and foremost, stories that I... I'd be interested in and hope I find an audience that way. Sure. Have you thought about what is it that appeals to you about writing thrillers and mysteries? I mean, I think it's what appeals to me about writing them is the same thing that appeals to me about reading them, which is, you know, I love slightly dark stories. I love um, people. I love reading about ordinary people who are tempted to do bad things, um, tempted and often do them. People in the gray area. Um, I, I just love, even when I was a kid, there was something about, you know, re, you know, discovering Sherlock Holmes and, um, the Moors, you know, Hound of the Baskervilles and the Moors and, and that sort of Gothic sensibility. Um, and something about reading those books when you're cozy at home, you know, on a winter's night, I just love that, that idea. And I love, uh, all kinds of crime fiction. You know, I like the cozier kinds. I like the darker serial killer stuff. It's just always appealed to me. Sure. So what is your process when you're working on a novel, your writing process? Do you outline extensively or do you write more organically? How does that work for you? I don't do any outlining at all. Um, at least not on paper or in my computer. Um, I do do um, outlining in my own head. I do a lot of daydreaming about a book before I start to write, write it, but I often, all I have is the premise and characters. And then I usually have in my, again, in my head where I think the ending should happen. Um, you know, what should happen at the ending kind of who the, who the baddie is and what they've been up to be, you know, the basic, um, drive of the book and i usually know very little about the middle um and at that point i start writing the book Uh, but as i'm writing it's not it's not like every day i'm completely making it up as i go along i'm thinking ahead and i'm thinking what might happen next um and i really love that process of uh writing a book on the fly as opposed to having it all plotted out in advance i think it's more exciting um you know, oftentimes I lay in bed at night and I think about, you know, a problem with the book and the next morning it's kind of comes to me what I might be able to do about it. Um, I, you know, it's just the way I like to write. I know I have writer friends who outline every little detail and they write great books. So I don't think there's a set way, but there's definitely a way that, that I like to do it. Sure. Well, do you ever sit down at your computer and have problems getting started writing for the day? <laughs> do it. Um, better question would be, do I ever not <laughs> sit down? I mean, I have problems, you know, I think 
I love my profession and I feel incredibly fortunate to be able to be, do this for a living. Um, but sometimes I tell myself that basically every day of my life is like having a paper to write that I don't, that, you know, I don't want to quite start. Um, cause I give myself a word count, you know, I tell myself when I'm working on a book, it's a thousand words a day. And so every day I kind of delay that inevitable start sounds like it's misery, but, and it, <laughs> it can be, um, so, you know, sometimes I wake up and get my coffee and I just get started, but most days I, I wake up and I procrastinate a little, do the crossword puzzle, check my emails, check the news, clean the office, <laughs> go on, go do errands. You know, eventually though, at, at some point I read what I wrote the day before and tell myself I got to get into it. And then I start and, you know, some days it flows, some days it's hard. Um, but if you write a thousand words a day, uh, eventually you have a book and sure. that's a great, that's, that's a great feeling. Well, well, given your success to date, what writing advice would you offer for those who are working on their own stories and novels? I mean, kind of what I just said, which is, um, set yourself a task, um, and, and, you know, maybe it's not a thousand words a day for you. Maybe it's a couple hundred or maybe you're Stephen King and you can write 5,000 words a day. Um, I think, but, but I think the key is to just do it every day and, and to do it, whether you feel like doing it or not, because I, you know, if you just wait for days when you feel like writing, I just, I don't think you're going to finish. I mean, maybe you're the type who can, but in general, I think you just got to, um, plow forward and then the other big piece of advice um is just to get to the finish line i think um i have this tendency and every writer does which is maybe you're halfway through and what's more appealing than than writing new words is going back and tinkering with that first chapter again and making it better um you'll have you always have time to do that but that first chapter is meaningless if you haven't written the last chapter it's worthless so the key is to get to the end. Um, and even if it's not in great shape, then you have something that's done and you can go back and work on it. So that, that I think is the best advice I can give any aspiring writer. Sure. So what fiction or nonfiction books have you read recently that you enjoyed? Um, I haven't read too much nonfiction lately, although I did. And this is the second time I've mentioned Stephen King. Um, and this, this ties in with writing advice too. Um, I did fairly recently read his, um, his great book about writing called on writing. Um, it's, uh, a book that's split between a how to writing advice and then also his own personal story of becoming a writer. Um, and it includes, um, the accident that nearly killed him it, for my money. It's right up there as one of the best writing manuals you can read. It's also very entertaining. So I go back to it every, every couple of years and reread it, um, just cause it inspires me all over again. So I would recommend that book. Um, in terms of what I've been reading fictionally, um, I'm in the middle of a little Linwood Barkley kick, um, mm -hmm. just read his elevator pitch book. Um, and oh boy. See, the title went out of my head. That's okay. It's a Noise Downstairs. That one was terrific. So uh, Linwood Bar Barkley's uh, recent book, A Noise Downstairs, which was a really good book. Um, and I've been enjoying him. That's great. So are you working on a new novel now? Yeah, I'm sort of finishing up a, um, a new book. It's just entering into the sort of editing phase. Um, I'm usually done with my next book when, the, when a book comes out. Mm -hmm. just the kind of schedule that I'm on. Um, in this new one, I, I feel good about it. It's, it's kind of a modern, uh, update on, uh, Agatha Christie's and then there were none. That's great. Well, where can people find you online if they want to learn more about you and your novels? So the best way to do that, I think is just go to my website, which is Peter hyphen Swanson.com. Um, and then from there you can get links to my Facebook page my Instagram page and my Twitter feed. 
Great. Well, again, we've been speaking with Peter Swanson, author of the new book, Every Vow You Break. The novel is on sale now, so go buy a copy. And Peter, thanks for doing this interview. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks for having me. Great. Now, stay tuned for a brief excerpt from the audiobook of Every Vow You Break by Peter Swanson, narrated by Carissa Vacker, available from Harper Audio, wherever audiobooks are sold. She first spotted him at Bobby's Coffee Shop on 22nd Street. He was at a window seat, idly looking at his phone, a white mug in front of him. Abigail was on her way to the office for her half day, dodging pedestrians on the sidewalk, thinking about the wedding, wondering if maybe she should have invited her cousin Donald and his wife, whose name she always forgot. Her feet kept moving, but it was as though her heart had skipped a beat. It was definitely him. Same wiry frame, same beard, same high cheekbones. Even through the glare coming off the plate glass window, she recognized him right away. And she also knew that he'd come to New York City because of her. He must have. When she made it to her office and settled down at her desk, her heart still thudding, she took a moment to consider all the possibilities. First of all, why was she so sure he was here to find her? She lived in New York, not some small town that no one visited. He could be here on vacation, here to visit friends, here for work. And even if he had come here to find her, how much did he even know about her? They hadn't given each other their real names. She still only knew him as Scotty, and he knew her as Madeline. She told herself there was nothing to worry about and tried to concentrate on work. But walking home, the nights getting darker earlier these days, she took a different route, staying off the busy avenues. She had no plans for that evening. Bruce was attending a work dinner, and she made herself an omelet, flipped through the channels, found one that was showing The Ring, the American remake with Naomi Watts. She'd watched it as a kid at a slumber party, and all the girls there had been traumatized except for Abigail, who'd fallen asleep in a brand new world, one that had movies in it that seemed designed just for her. After the credits had rolled, she sent a text to Bruce saying she was going to bed, then quickly checked her emails, ignoring one from Zoe titled, Emergency Wedding Question, and opening an email from an address she didn't recognize titled simply, Hi. Dear Madeline, I am sorry to write you like this so soon before your wedding, but I can't stop thinking about you. If you don't share similar feelings, then tell me and I promise to never bother you again. But if you do feel the same way, then maybe it's not too late to cancel the wedding. The exact halfway point between New York City and San Francisco is Wood River, Nebraska. Maybe they have a travel lodge we can meet at? Just hopeful, Scotty. She read the message through twice, an ache moving from the base of her throat down to her stomach. The email would have been bad enough, but she'd seen him earlier, in her neighborhood. Or had she? If he was really here then why didn't he say so in the email? He doesn't want to entirely freak you out. He was here, and he was looking for her. Maybe he'd figure if she responded positively to the email, he'd say something like, guess what, I'm actually in New York. Didn't want to tell you because I thought you might be thinking I was stalking you. Ha ha. And maybe it was as simple as all that. He was here in New York for some reason besides coming to find her and decided to send the email. All she had to do was tell him that she was still getting married and she'd never hear from him again. But another part of her was telling her that it was more serious than that. That he'd somehow fallen for her and now he was stalking her. What other word described it? 